Yes, start, ma'am. You can start now. Okay. Uh, good morning. Oh, that um, is only uh, from from Catla. You have to just go and uh, unlock it. So there is no key, I think. And let me know if you can hear me or if I need to change my uh, my microphone. So good morning. My time, good afternoon, your time. I'm Sarah Coles. I'm one of the radiologists from Calgary, Alberta. And uh, continuing from our webinar last week, I'm going to talk about case-based review of musculoskeletal and spine intervention. Um, and I've taken a few cases here, sort of launching from last week's discussion about NEOA. And I'll go through a bit more evidence and, and how we built our, our clinical practice. So let me... So I'm going to go through case-based review and we'll talk about joints, soft tissues focused on tendons and spine. Uh, considering the uh, time that we have this afternoon, uh, it'll be difficult to go through. There are many other areas we can talk about ligaments, um, peripheral nerves, but... Um, I mean, can, you, can you just speak louder and can you remove these two uh, things on your uh, screen? One is the, that, uh, the, uh, the upper screen. You just move it up, up, up upwards. I'll try. Let me see. And you drag it and drag it up. Sure. Uh, I'll try. Yes. There. Ah, that's okay, ma'am. And just that's speak, ma'am, okay. little loudly. Yes. Sure. Okay. Okay. I'll try this. Let me just make sure. Okay. So uh, we're going to start with uh, musculoskeletal cases to begin. Uh, just to review, last uh, Friday we talked about image-guided, uh, the benefit of image guidance for joint injections. Um, sometimes it's nice to have numbers if we're going to talk to our colleagues about this. Um, this is a study done in 2013 by a sports medicine doctor who looked at, um, in this case it was ultrasound guided compared to palpation injections. And across the board, either using ultrasound or low-dose fluoroscopy was far superior to palpation. And it also um, connoted a very low complication risk, which is something else to consider. I also mentioned before when patients are having to pay out of pocket for something like a hyaluronic acid injection, it's nice to know that they're uh, getting them into the right, um, the right side, the right part in the joint. So here, for example, in the knee, the knee I think is quite an easy joint to inject by palpation, depending on your patient's size and the underlying pathology, but. Um, by palpation, it can be as low as 40%, uh, and that increases under ultrasound to 75%. Again, my feeling about joints, and if you have a choice between ultrasound or fluoroscopy, we prefer fluoroscopy. We find it faster. You can use intraarticular contrast to confirm distribution and flow within the joint. Uh, ultrasound, I think, adds some technical challenges, so depending on the, the user's comfort. Uh, the other numbers here are more impressive. Certainly the uh, palpation in the hip struck me as unusual at 100%. We'll talk about the hip in a moment. Um, but the uh, ultrasound with palpation for the elbow and glenohumeral joint, perhaps a bit higher, but uh, we know with ultrasound guidance and in our experience, fluoroscopy, much higher numbers. So the first case I'm going to talk about is a 50-year-old male with known hip arthritis. This is based on a, a colleague of mine who presented at our clinic. Uh, again, I'm using some of the short, uh, shortened formats. So CS stands for corticosteroid, HA stands for hyaluronic acid. So this patient had tried corticosteroid injections. Certainly they were effective for the hip OA, but it was frustrating for him. He's a chiropractor and he found he really received only about six weeks of relief from it. Uh, and he was coming back looking for a more durable response. He was on the wait list to be assessed for a total hip arthroplasty, given the degree of his arthritis. And he was sent to our clinic for a hyaluronic acid injection. So we proceeded, and in his case, we did a combination injection. It had been more than three months since his last steroid injection, so we provided Singal injection, which is a combination of corticosteroid and HA. That's a high molecular weight uh, HA. 
Uh, and the screen on your, the image on your uh, left shows the typical approach. And I'll talk about some of the technique for hip branch injections. You can see he has significant joint space narrowing, even in supine imaging. And uh, we have our needle in place and there's some contrast here in the joint confirming position before we proceed with the injection. The, we always take pain scores when we do our injections, pre-procedure and post-procedure. And patients can give a post-procedure score quite quickly. We're not having to wait. Typically we have it within a few minutes of their procedure or as they're on the way out of the procedure room. So in this patient's um, experience, he came in with a five out of 10 pain and immediately went to zero out of 10. So we know there's a good diagnostic value uh, in, this, um, in this test. And I'll talk about what else we inject and, and why that's important in a moment. Interestingly though, four hours later, he called me and he said, look, I'm having a lot of discomfort in this hip. Uh, I can barely walk. It's very stiff, a significant amount of pain. Um, and I had done the procedure, so I was comfortable knowing that I was in the joint. I knew what I injected, no, um, no pressure uh, during the injection, so I knew I hadn't extended extra articular. And I told him to keep me posted. He took some anti-inflammatories and pain medication. And within uh, 24 hours, the, uh, he had some residual crepitus, but gradually he reported increased um, range of motion and some resolution of his pain but it took almost two weeks for him to have an overall improved pain score or improved pain, um, improved gait and range of motion compared to when he first came in. So this is an important case. Uh, it's easy to do these injections, but there are some complications around it. So let's talk a little bit about intraarticular hip um, injection with hyaluronic acid, specifically around osteoarthritis, which is the most common indication. The steroids, uh, tend to be less effective once the inflammation in the joint has been treated. And patients often tend to have more uh, persistent mechanical symptoms around the hip. It's quite a tight joint. Um, the, the benefit of hip um, hyaluronic acid is in some studies, it shows a decrease of oral medication by 60% um, over two years. This is one of the, the um, markers that we're looking for for success of these injections. Uh, and it does provide increased range of motion and improved function. This uh, image is a bit blurry, I apologize, but a similar, you can see some spurring around the joint and our typical approach right at the lateral femoral head neck junction. There are, however, complications such as in this case, um, and we'll talk about that. But the most important thing about hip injections, despite uh, the prior palpation guided um, study is these really should all be image guided. Even ultrasound, uh, we uh, polled some of our uh, sports medicine colleagues who use ultrasound in our area, and many of them uh, defer to us to do these injections. Uh, in a larger patient, it's very hard to see the joint and hard to know that you're intraarticular. So fluoroscopy here should be king, and this should be the primary uh, route of injection. The hip is a unique joint, it's tight, and I reference you to the image on the right. There are significant dense fibrous bands, tendons and muscles around this area uh, and ligaments which support the joint. Um, and there've also been studies that show that a diseased hip joint capsule, like in the case of osteoarthritis, is thicker than, than an asymptomatic patient. So you're dealing with an even tighter joint and a quite a small joint space to get into uh, under fluoroscopy or with your needle. Um, there's a study here I referenced by Riviera um, done in 2016 where they reviewed 270 patients who had high molecular weight, hyaluronic acid uh, injected into the hips. They reported 0.5 transient synovitis in the first 24 hours. And interestingly, in a lot of these studies, uh, which I'll show you in a moment, there, there's very little reporting of complications or adverse events, which makes it hard to understand how many of these people are really presenting? Are we following them close enough? And what is this process? The reason we're particularly interested uh, in the hip is that in our practice doing these injections, uh, certainly when we were st first started doing hyaluronic acid injections in the hip, we had complications. It accounted for about 30% of our complications in the hip joint. So it's quite significant. And um, certainly we wanted to have a better understanding of what was going on and how we could make it better.
So just a quick reference back to, these are some of the studies I talked about in last uh, week's uh, webinar, but just to show you the relative paucity of reporting of uh, adverse effects. So here are four big studies talking about hyaluronic acid therapy. This was relevant to the knee. Um, and of these, of the any adverse effects, um, only two of the four uh, reported these adverse effects and uh, the overall serious adverse effects were reported in three of the four studies. There are also local adverse effects that were referenced. And um, again, these were reported in only three of the four studies, although there were many more studies as part of this uh, presentation by Dr. Bandari. And it just goes to highlight the limited data that we're working with. Uh, just to clarify here, Dr. Bandari had gone through these studies and the local adverse effect injection site flare-ups uh, were considered pain, swelling, and arthralgia. And we'll talk about the different type of adverse effects in a moment. So three main complications, and this is based on my personal breakdown and, and what I see in our practice. So things to be aware of when you're injecting hyaluronic acid in any joint. Uh, the first we consider injection related. This is often iatrogenic, could be related to your technique, to the volume that you're injecting, uh, perhaps your pericapsular, perhaps you didn't let the freezing work before you injected the joint. The second is what I call substance related. Uh, and this is where some of this data that we're seeing is coming out, although it's quite thin, uh, there's been a described a granulomatous reaction. And I'll talk about that more I think that's what happened in our prior patient here in case one. And of course, the final is the dreaded true uh, septic joint from an infection. Overall, the reactions reported in the literature related to hyaluronic acid range from between one to 30%. Obviously, this is hugely variable. This incorporates uh, injections that were done by palpation under guidance, under ultrasound, under fluoroscopy, um, and different types of hyaluronic acid and variable technique. So the, the range is significant. The majority of the literature to date is really about knee injections. So I'll talk a little bit about our experience and how we've managed to decrease our complications, but I think it's important to monitor and certainly to be aware of. So back to the knee, uh, with some of the literature, again, it's more robust about the knee. So let's talk first about some of the injection related complications with hyaluronic acid. The range, as I mentioned, is one to 30%, but on average, people are reporting 3% injection related at the knee. Again, this is a fairly easy joint to inject. Patients typically do quite well. If it's related to your injection, patients will often complain of pain right away. You'll see a bump up in your pain score from pre to post procedure. But we describe these injections, I think about them temporarily. So really this is an injection within the first 12 hours that starts quite quickly, but resolves within the first 12 hours. And it's characterized by pain at the injection site. Most typically, you may have some pain, joint pain and swelling, but that's less common. And again, skin bruising, depending on uh, what the cause of the symptoms are. Typically, these resolve, as I mentioned, quite quickly, but they can last up to 72 hours, and they tend to get better and respond to oral medication. So why would you get an injection related uh, adverse effect related to hyaluronic acid at the knee in particular? Well, there's a few considerations. And I think one of the things that looking back, um, we did a retrospective review of our own practice and looking under fluoroscopy at where the contrast, if the contrast is not spreading through the joint, uh, we will often see patients presenting with complications or increased pain score. And some of those, you'll see the contrast pooling so I, I believe a lot of them end up in the fat pad, possibly next to plica or somehow contained within the joint such that the medication and the injection cannot distribute through the joint. Uh, the other for sure problem would be patellofemoral OA. Um, and I'll talk about the technique and the approach around the knee in a moment, but patellofemoral OA can make it quite difficult to inject at the front. There's often regional synovitis and you're injecting into kind of a hot spot of the knee or focal synovitis elsewhere, depending on your approach. Uh, extra articular considerations, obviously, if you're not in the joint when you're doing the injection, subcutaneous tissues, if you're going through some other area of inflammation or other pericapsular causes like bursitis. So just to highlight for you about the knee, uh, these intraarticular fat pads, 
Um, certainly the, uh, and I'll talk about the specific approach, I tend to go super lateral, but you're trying to get behind the suprapatellar fat pad here highlighted in red and superficial to the prefemoral fat. Um, and if you're coming from an infrapatellar approach, obviously the infrapatellar fat pad is quite large. So by doing this under fluoroscopy and putting a bit of contrast in the joint, you have the confidence that this is able to distribute in the joint and less likely to have complications. So in our experience, as I said, approach does matter. I show you on the right some of uh, my colleagues' injections. Everybody does it their own way. You come out of your training and uh, people have their, their range of comfort. Uh, sports medicine physicians and orthopedic surgeons typically have patients sitting or with the knee bent, often going into an arthroscopic portal in Fripatellar, which is what we're seeing in uh, certainly the two middle images here on the right. But when we did our retrospective review, 80% of our reactions occurred after hyaluronic acid injection at the knee by uh, an infralateral approach. And there was a study done by Strauss at all that showed really that injecting into the supralateral recess um, did provide the least or the fewest com uh, complications around the knee joint. So this is where I tend to inject quite routinely. I find I have the patient's uh, knee fully extended and I'll often draw the patella towards me and I inject just beneath the patella and it tends to be a very sweet spot. You almost have a, a negative vacuum or, um, space that you can inject into. But ultimately you need to be comfortable and confident in your specific needle technique uh, for consistency. So that's the injection, uh, certainly any other joint around uh, that you're injecting, you can have similar issues. I mentioned the hip already being a very tight capsule, certainly that's at risk of, uh, of pericapsular uh, complications or intra articular complications that are iatrogenic. So let's talk now about hyaluronic acid complications related to the substance. So what we're injecting is causing the problems and the adverse effects. Uh, and this is what we know about this so far. This so-called uh, pseudoseptic or granulomatous response to hyaluronic acid injection in a joint results in a flare that starts not immediately, but after 12 hours. So it gives us some temporal separation from the prior uh, injection complication. Uh, they report in the literature between 1% to 3%, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. As I said, going through the literature is interesting. Some refer to it as a granulomatous response or an adverse effect, but there tends to be a more common uh, naming of a pseudosepsis reaction. These really do present like infection, and what happens is the patients will often present to emergent care or urgent care saying, you know, they, don't, they may not have a fever, but they've just had an injection. And in our experience, our emergency colleagues interpret this as an infection in the joint and often go in and aspirate out the hyaluronic acid um, and start patient on antibiotics. So I think it's really important that we're aware of this and the more that we can manage it ourselves and have uh, an appropriate management algorithm is really important. Otherwise, these patients are treated incorrectly. It is definitely characterized by much more inflammation and swelling compared to the type of uh, the iatrogenic causes. And as I said, starting at about 12 hours. So what is the cause? Could there be another iatrogenic cause? Is it related to the, uh, some mechanical problem of this injection, the viscosity of this hyaluronic acid in the joint? Is it a sensitization reaction? Well, the literature to date would suggest that there's a microcrystalline aseptic response, which is a type four immune response. So this is not an allergy. You'll, you'll hear patients say, I've had an allergic response before. Um, I think this is more an intra-articular, uh, they talk about this aseptic. The crystals are important though. Uh, we are seeing crystals in some of these reactions. And I just mentioned that uh, some of the prep, the skin prep might have ammonium salt in it. And that's been shown to if you use these ammonium skin preparations, when you inject hyaluronic acid into the joint, uh, these can crystallize in the joint, so that may predispose your patients to these reactions. Uh, the most important thing about this is typically it's self-limiting, but you, you may be required, uh, either you or, or your uh, primary care colleague, to provide some short-term um, care for the patient. That's pain management, 
anti-inflammatories. And rarely, if it persists, uh, you may need to go into a joint aspiration to exclude infection uh, and consider a steroid injection, which we do very rarely in these cases. Interestingly, these pseudoseptic responses related to hyaluronic acid in the joint are more common with those patients who've had repeated HA injections, not the first injection, typically the second or third. Uh, in my experience, if this happens, the next time we try a different hyaluronic acid, a different type, um, and typically the, the patients don't no longer have a, a problem. They seem to be associated with higher molecular weight hyaluronic acids as well as cross-linked hyaluronic acids. And for those of you who were on the webinar last week, the unfortunate thing about that is that these are the uh, preferential hyaluronic acid uh, uh, injections for any joints. Higher molecular weight and cross-linked molecular weight have a better response and last longer in the joint. So it's unfortunate that they may also be associated with this pseudoseptic reaction. So what are you looking for? Clinically, before, as I mentioned, typically 12 to 72 hours. In our experience, often even beyond 12 hours, up to 24 hours after an injection. So really able to separate this from an iatrogenic cause. And the patient is presenting or calling with severe joint pain and swelling, but they remain afebrile. Typically, these progress over the first day or two um, and there may be no response to conservative therapy. Sarah, we lost your voice. Within 72 hours, come back to our clinic so we can clinically assess them. Uh, these patients, when they have uh, lab tests, have high normals, CRP and ESR, obviously fairly nonspecific, maybe just an inflammatory response, but notably normal white blood cells. And the patients who've gone on to join aspiration, uh, of course, have negative culture, typically negative crystals. These are often microcrystals, harder to pick up on some of our tests, and maybe a, a, a sampling error as well. Um, sometimes we do see some um, WBC in the joint, but um, typically this is a very low number. So all in all, the lab doesn't help you much. Really, we're, the most um, reliable information here is knowing that you've injected hyaluronic acid into a joint. The temporal presentation of these patients, not immediately, but usually within a day or two, more with pain and swelling, um, remaining afebrile, and you're trying conservative management. The septic joint, it's important to know, obviously this is the one you're wanting to exclude, but you, we need to know this is very rare, assuming that you're using good um, aseptic technique. A meta-analysis of 18 studies showed just one case in over 2,200 studies. And really, regardless of what you're injecting, it's not specific to hyaluronic acid. Studies show the risk of a septic joint is the same for injecting hyaluronic acid or saline. But notably, and comfortably, these are very rare. So, uh, and typically they'll also present as we know, 48 hours or longer. So on the temporal spectrum, you'll end up with iatrogenic causes immediately. After a day, a pseudoseptic reaction for the first day or two. And if you're worried about a septic joint, these are patients that really are fine until they present a few days later and obviously have more uh, symptoms of infection, including fever. So. I think it's important to be aware of these different complications. Uh, it may give you some guidance in terms of uh, how to manage them in your own practice. I think the more we can manage them within our own practice is better rather than having to rely on emergency colleagues. Certainly in, in my experience, they have very little knowledge of hyaluronic acid, what these complications are, the techniques. So I find that they typically revert immediately to the assumption that there's a joint infection. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the hip joint technique. I mentioned earlier that it was one of our major complications that we are experiencing, and we, we wanted to understand better and how we could limit those injections. Again, I apologize for the quality of this uh, injection image here. We do go at the anterior head neck junction. It's valuable, very valuable to get your patient positioned correctly. So having your patient 
I often put a sandbag adjacent to the ankle, having them lie supine with the toe up or in a neutral position. Not only does it take some pressure off the anterior aspect of the hip joint, but it elongates your femoral neck and gives you better access. Um, certainly, I know a lot of you do vascular procedures, so you're well versed at this, but these are just some tips from our own practice. There's one study that talked about adding a bit of uh, hip flexion uh, that decreased. This is a complicated graph on the lower left, but I highlight in yellow that really when they had the patient's hip uh, flexed in 45 degrees, there's less pressure in the joint and that made for improved distribution of medication in the joint. Practically, I think it's quite difficult to uh, inject if the patient's got a 45 degrees of flexion and also the volumes in the study are up around 12 to 14 um, milliliters where it starts to show a significant difference. We're injecting much on the uh, lower uh, volume scale of four, maybe five milliliters in a, a hip joint, which can accept, as you see here, up to larger volumes. But sometimes, sometimes just for patient comfort, if their knee is bothering them or they have significant hip OA, we'll put a sponge under the knee and even 15 degrees of hip joint inflection tends not to cause a problem with the injection, but makes the patient more comfortable and able to give us that neutral position of the leg. Other joints, just briefly, uh, before we come back to some of our, uh, our own experience about these, the ankle, I say usually image guided, a lot of our orthopedic colleagues uh, do this under uh, palpation. And typically we all go anterior approach with your patient lying on the side. Uh, some studies have shown that image guidance does improve your outcome here. Rare complications in the literature, although Mayfair, the MF, we actually have had two of our 17 cases from ankle joints. I think these were iatrogenic in my review of these cases. Um, perhaps when you're putting hyaluronic acid in the anterior ankle, your needle tends to bump out. And I think some of this was um, put into the uh, extra capsular or pericapsular space. Uh, elbow, we usually do a lateral approach um, and coming down onto the radius. This is also a very tight joint and I think it's prone to extra articular spread. So just to be aware of. Shoulder, we'll typically do an anterior approach under fluoroscopy with the arm and external rotation. Um, rare complications. We do a lot of shoulder injections, glenohumeral injections. Uh, we had one case in our experience where we had a complication. Again, I wonder if this is not related to the viscosity of hyaluronic acid in a, in a joint where you're placing it in the anterior recess. So just a quick review of our uh, hyaluronic acid injection complications in our own practice. And uh, we had a presentation of this last year with our sports medicine and orthopedic colleagues, sort of opening our kimono, if you will, um, because there are very few complications reported in the literature. I think this is valuable for us to understand what our complications are, how do we improve. Um, so over the past three years, this is dating to last year, overall, we had a complication rate after intraarticular hyaluronic acid in, in particular of less than 1% which based on the numbers I showed you previously is quite, quite impressive and uh, certainly uh, in a safe zone. Uh, overall, knowing that we inject about 200 patients a day or more, uh, we had a total of 17 cases. Now these were self-reported to be fair. Um, and on my review, I found based on the temporal presentation of these cases, reviewing the arthroscopy and the patient, the, sorry, the images for our injection and the patient's um, history, I think about half of these were iatrogenic. They presented early, likely related to our injection. And about nine of them were probably the so-called pseudoseptic or granulomatous um, responses and complications. We had no confirmed infections. Of course, uh, in the past year, we have had one confirmed intraarticular infection of the knee. Um, I will qualify this that uh, sometimes our emergency colleagues don't let us know if patients have presented there. Sometimes you see your, your patients in the hospital when we work there coming through emergency, having had an injection. I'm always very interested. Where did they have the injection? Was it our, at our clinic? So some of the data is hard to get, but uh, we do ask all of our patients to call us uh, and to report immediately if they do have complications. And most are fairly uh, forthcoming about that. Interestingly, though, and specific to the hip joint, we were having a lot of specific uh, complications initially. So back in 2017, 
um, early 2017, we began to routinely add a small dose of intraarticular anesthetic when we did these hyaluronic acid injections, just to see if it made a difference. And it sure did. We had an overall complication related to more the hip, uh, decreased from 2.5% to 0.6%. And we also had a decrease um, in the injection related complications from about 50% of those uh, specific cases down to 30%. So now, since 2017, we do routinely add a small volume of interest articular anesthetic. We use 0.5% bupivacaine. And depending on the joint, we'll use anywhere from 0.5 cc to a maximum of 2 cc. And I think there's a few fold reason why this is. Um, number one, some of the higher molecular weight um, hyaluronic acids are quite viscous. Sarah can't hear you. So I think by adding a little bit of anesthetic, you're uh, making it less viscous and improving the chance of it spreading around the joint. Sarah, could you just repeat that last sentence? Sure, sorry. Um, when we do the injection, uh, it's adding, adding a little bit of anesthetic to these very viscous hyaluronic acids. I think in, it obviously decreases the viscosity and perhaps let the hyaluronic acid spread more around the joint. So that's been our experience is that when we do these injections, notably around the hip, we'll, when we put our needle in place and we've confirmed our intraarticular position, we do a flush with a tiny volume of interest, uh, intraarticular anesthetic, bupivacaine. It almost helps um, lubricate the joint, open the joint. Then we put in our hyaluronic acid and then we wash and flush with a bit more um, anesthetic tends to be quite effective in our experience. Uh, so before I talk about intraarticular anesthetic, you may have some questions about that if some of you are familiar with the literature. Just to show you our own retrospective review, this is now all joints and our practice after intraarticular hyaluronic acid over a three-year uh, retrograde review uh, of adverse effects. And based on what we can tell in the literature plus our own experience, separating it out into these three different types of infection, very temporal related and different presentations. So the first injection related published uh, is about 3%. In our clinics, injection related, certainly after adding intraarticular anesthetic has decreased to 0.23%. Most patients have pain scores that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, they jump up off the table, feel great, walk out of our clinic. Um, that makes for an easier clinic flow uh, and patient management. These substance-related pseudoseptic reactions I talked about, published literature, I say here 1% to 3%, but as I mentioned, some uh, go up to 30%. I think that's general. I don't think that's separated out into the different types. But in our practice now, we're running at about 0.4%. Again, we're comfortable with this number. It's something we can manage. And uh, I do think the intraarticular anesthetic is helpful. Infection at the time of our study, uh, published literature was 0.04% and we had 0%. But as I mentioned, we have had one um, joint uh, infection in the past year, not included in these numbers. So I know my sports medicine colleagues would say, well, hang on a minute and orthopedic colleagues, Intraarticular anesthetic is not safe. There's been studies showing that. And I think it's important for you to be aware that there, is a, there was a very uh, uh, unfortunate uh, study done. It was a post-operative continuous infusion study in, done in 2009 by an orthopedic surgeon who basically had done a knee surgery and left a drain in place and just pumped in anesthetic, um, different types of anesthetic over a period of 12 hours. And this documented cartilage toxicity. In fact, the cartilage fell apart in these patients. And I show you there that rapivacaine was less toxic than lidocaine, than bupivacaine. Well, in our clinic, both by cost and access, bupivacaine is our preferred intraarticular medication. So 
obviously this is concerning when we say to our colleagues in our, that we're injecting bupivacaine. But I think we need to step back and consider how we inject it and the volume that we inject. And you know, in our experience, and uh, there's been a subsequent study in arthroscopy in 2016, small volumes, and I mentioned earlier between 0.5 to 2 cc, biggest benefit in our experience is it allows a pain score to be obtained. We're looking for some diagnostic benefit in these injections. When we see knee away, fine, it's most likely the cause. But around the shoulder, for example, and in the back, which we'll talk about, it can be quite complicated. Are we, uh, we want to have a pain score to know that the patient's pain has resolved and we're in the, we diagnose the, the source of pain. So that's hyaluronic acid. Uh, I, we do, I did suggest uh, adding a little bit of anesthetic to these injections. Uh, as I mentioned, I think it's been quite uh, valuable, certainly in our experience. So I'm gonna move on now. Um, we're gonna talk about a second case here with knee pain. We talked last time about OA and MRI and how we're really be, we're becoming quite hamstrung in the use of MRI for knee OA. But here's a case, it is very valuable. This is a patient who on X-ray might show a little bit of spurring and perhaps mild medial compartment joint space narrowing, but there is definitely cartilage fraying, uh, some meniscal degeneration on the MRI. This patient declined arthroscopy. So what are your options? Well, we've talked already about intraarticular corticosteroids the other day, a first line uh, defense here, uh, intraarticular hyaluronic acid. The other, I'm just gonna talk briefly here about PRP and show you some of the literature to date. Um, a lot of patients, certainly young patients, will say, I don't want steroids. They're, they're adverse to the idea of steroids in the joint. And typically of these options, they'd rather start with something less um, foreign. So they really like the idea of PRP, which is our platelet-rich plasma. So briefly, this is a concentrated extract of the patient's own blood containing platelets, growth factor, and cytokines. And basically it stimulates an inflammatory cascade in the joint. So this is in contradistinction to steroids, which are anti-inflammatory, PRP is really pro-inflammatory. And what the literature suggests is it both protects the cartilage that's in place and perhaps produces cartilage, which in the patient I'm showing here with a little bit of cartilage fissuring could be very valuable. Uh, just in terms of our patient preparation, we advise no anti-inflammatories for two weeks pre and post injection. We advise waiting more than three months after steroid injection if you're gonna do these. Uh, typically, there are different preparations between 30 to 60 cc blood draw, which are then centrifuged, PRP is extracted, and your PRP is normalized before being injected. Here is one uh, kit that we use uh, on the right side, uh, and it's a fairly straightforward clinic procedure to be done. We have a nurse on site who draws the blood, spins it, uh, and performs this. Um, it's a fairly closed uh, procedure to prepare sterilely. So quickly now, the evidence for PRP. Um, some of the studies I reference in the bottom right demonstrate that both PRP and intraarticular hyaluronic acid are effective for knee OA in particular. Um, this study did three weekly injections of both PRP um, and intraarticular hyaluronic acid, lower volume. So that would have been the SYNVISC, which is typically 2cc, notably not image guided. Uh, clinical follow up was performed at 2, 6, and 12 months. And both PRP and intraarticular hyaluronic acid demonstrated improved symptoms and function compared to placebo. In a separate study, uh, PRP was better than hyaluronic acid at one year in 160 patients. Uh, as I mentioned before, hyaluronic acid typically gets at least six months response. So it's interesting to see that PRP now is having a longer uh, response for patients beyond that. Uh, PRP effective in early knee OA. Again, if we can diagnose these early knee patients, um, this study did three PRP injections on 48 patients and followed them also out to a year. And the PRP demonstrated significant improvement in pain, stiffness, and um, daily living um, scores. Uh, PRP injection here versus a single hyaluronic injection. Um, 
again, following up uh, pain scores and function scores up to one year. Uh, the one year mark is very valuable information. I think uh, the pain scores in this study uh, done just in 2017 is that PRP was higher pain score or the pain score was improved rather with PRP compared to HA, both at six months and 12 months. The pain score was improved for both, certainly earlier than that at 12 weeks. Um, but the functional scores were also better with PRP compared to HA dating or extending out to one year. So there is some evidence to suggest that PRP compared to what we know now that HA is effective, PRP also seems to uh, offer some benefit to these patients. Briefly, how many injections? Uh, the initial literature, as many of these I've just shown you, are three injections separated by one to two weeks. We typically still recommend that. That's what most of the literature um, depends on, although um, there have been some studies that compare it to one injection, and one injection is also effective. Uh, here's a study looking at 92 prospective patients, randomized. In this case, they did the PRP injections one month apart, so it's quite variable in terms of the time between injections. But all these patients had improved pain, range of motion, and quality of life measurements past 18 months. Again, that's quite a durable response, even compared to what we know about hyaluronic acid. This study would suggest an annual top-off of PRP for symptom relief. Uh, other studies have shown single PRP, as I mentioned, as, as effective as three PRP injections. This study only went to six month follow-up though, um, that uh, some I think most of the other ones going out to 12 months have relied on three injections. So I don't think we have enough data yet. Um, so in our practice, we still suggest three PRP injections. Patients pay for this out of pocket. It's not covered by our uh, healthcare system. So some patients, ultimately, it's a money decision and will choose to have a single injection rather than the three, the series of three. So that was a quick review of PRP. There's obviously much more data, but uh, based on the current guidelines I suggested last week, it's still uh, not considered one of the primary uh, treatments uh, based on the quality um, and the inconsistency of the literature. Uh, just a quick mention, uh, I'm often asked about prolotherapy uh, for the joints. Uh, this is generally discouraged. There's inadequate uh, supportive literature and the technique is too variable. Sometimes there's, you know, 40 uh, cc injected in and around the joint. Um, it takes a long time. I think there's some value in needling, but I don't think we have enough data here yet for prolotherapy. So just quickly then our joint um, injection algorithm Steroid will do typically for all patients. It's covered in our system. I think it deals with the intra-articular inflammatory component that we talked about last week. Um, and you can repeat these, but no more than every three months. If there's no response or the patient's had too many injections, so more than 300 milligrams a year, um, then that's when you're gonna start to go on to hyaluronic acid. I just put the Singel, that's the combined steroid hyaluronic acid on the left. There is a separate um, offering now that you could just go straight to hyaluronic acid. There's no limit to the number of injections patients can receive. Usually we do one injection, suggest they go away and, and come back when their symptoms return. Often that's not till one year, uh, depending on the degree of inflammation uh, and osteoarthritis in the joint. We'll often suggest a steroid injection uh, before and then wait two weeks before hyaluronic acid if they're not having Singal. Uh, if the patient chooses to have PRP, we'll often suggest it as a third step, but as I mentioned, some patients prefer just to start directly with this. There's no harm in that. And as I mentioned, we advise three injections and we advise the patient it's better for early arthritis. It may not help in end-stage arthritis. Um, I've mentioned that. So that's a quick review of our joints, as much as I can cover for you. I'm gonna go over a few more soft tissue and a few back injections. So bear with me and we'll try to get done by our 6.30 mark. Um, another patient here, right-handed dominant patient with chronic lateral elbow pain, limiting ability to work. Uh, on the ultrasound here, you see hypervascularity. This is the common extensor tendon, no obvious tear or adjacent bursitis. This is right at the site of pain. So in these patients, when we do imaging, typically x-ray is gonna be normal for a lot of tendon pathology and tendinosis. When we do ultrasounds for tendon pathology, you may see um, uh, tendon fiber irregularity, you may see hypervascularity or thickening, uh, 
you might see a tear, and you might see adjacent bursitis. So in this patient, the patient in this case rather, the patient has lateral epicondylitis. So what therapy can we offer? Well, we typically will do a primary steroid injection next to the tendon. I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. The benefit is confirms the diagnosis and provides some symptom relief quite quickly. Uh, steroid injections specifically to the lateral epicondyle, uh, the literature is tending to discourage that altogether. We tend to suggest one maximum of two injections separated by at least three to six months. Uh, we know that repeated steroid injections will weaken the college, collagen, putting the tendon at risk of rupture. Uh, Do the steroid injections, which, as I say, we still do one, uh, maximum two. Uh, here's what we're looking for is we're trying to put the steroid uh, to the left. I've tried to label the common extensor tendon just above the lateral humerus. And we're doing a peritendinous injection labeled on the right there in red, where we put 20 milligrams of a corticosteroid and 0.5 cc of bupivacaine just above the tendon. So you've done this injection and the patient responds initially very well, but they have continued lateral elbow pain that comes back six weeks later and Here's our tendinosis algorithm. I apologize, the <laughs> changing from different um, PowerPoint presentations has altered some of my, uh, my arrows. But basically, we start with the peritendin a steroid injection. If appropriate, we'll do a second one. But sometimes, uh, if the patient's response is limited, we'll go on. The next thing we suggest is what we call a tenotomy. This is a, a needle tenotomy, not to be confused with the tenotomy performed by our orthopedic colleagues. So what is it? Well, this is something we can do easily under ultrasound guidance. And basically it's a needling of the tendon in the area of maximal hyperemia and tendinosis. And this is really, um, they think is, is creating the sort of a controlled but an acute injury. As you know, a lot of tendinosis is subacute or more typically chronic. There tends not to be a lot of hyperemia in these cases. And so there's not a lot of active remodeling. So really what we're trying to do is tip the patient into an acute injury and uh, have a more um, systematic healing uh, by fibroblastic and collagen proliferation. So here's our needle. This is from the side. Typically we're trying to go perpendicular um, again at the area of maximal tenderness. This is lateral epicondyle treatment on both sides. I apologize. I tried to get videos of this for the presentation, but I couldn't get them in time. Um, so, tenotomy, when would you do or offer a tenotomy? Uh, again, like in this case, for patients who are unresponsive to conservative therapy or prior steroid injections, or perhaps have had too many steroid injections. Uh, like with our PRP injections, we suggest no anti-inflammatories for two weeks before the procedure and two weeks after. Again, this is a pro-inflammatory treatment. We want the, the body to have the, the largest inflammatory response for the best outcome. What are the contraindications to tendons? Well, besides you know, active infection and skin uh, pathology, really it's tendon pathology. If there's a low grade partial tear, it's not retracted. This works just as well in our experience. But if you do have a tendon tear that's retracted from the emphasis or retracted from the tendon or a high grade partial tear, you're putting the patient at risk of tendon, further tendon rupture. Uh, so these patients we will not offer tenotomy for. So soft tissue injections in general, um, these are the different types that we do. We'll do trigger point injections for diagnostic value. Um, there's obviously not a lot that we can do long-term, but it does help confirm to the patient that this is the area of pain and they can go on to more conservative treatment for those trigger points. Uh, we do popliteal cyst aspiration or ganglion cyst aspiration. We inject bursa. We do perineural peripheral nerve injections, perifascial injections tendon sheath for those patients with tenosynovitis, 
Uh, and as I mentioned here, tendon injections, we do tenotomies. We do not put steroids into tendons. Muscle tears, we do some needling work with freezing. Uh, typically, steroids are contraindicated within muscles as well. Uh, this box on the right also didn't project very well, but this is about tendinosis in general. Typically, an overuse type injury. We see it commonly in athletes, but it does involve uh, up to 6% of the general population. Uh, chronic right shoulder pain, briefly another type of pathology you'll see is calcific tendinosis. Um, so how do we manage calcific tendinosis? Well, we do an ultrasound for all these patients, trying to define the volume of calcium, where it is, and get a better um, uh, idea of how to approach it. For all these patients, we advise first a subacromial bursal injection. Number one, this confirms the diagnosis. Patients feel better. Often these patients are quite tender. Um, and it, uh, it, sometimes that's all you need. There's a natural uh, evolution of calcific tendinosis. It's painful during the deposition of calcium and again, during the resorptive stage. So sometimes patients are presenting already in the resorptive stage and a bursal injection should be adequate to get them through. Nonetheless, if the symptoms persist despite the injection up to six weeks or it recurs after three months, we'll often then go on to barbitage. And again, this is a needle uh, procedure for these calcific um, deposits that tend to be quite effective. Uh, for the bursa, by the way, we do 40 milligrams of trimcinolone with 2 cc of bupivacaine for our bursal injections. So how do we go about barbitage? Well, there's different techniques. Uh, we could do a single penetration technique uh, with one needle uh, injected into the uh, calcific deposition, the largest deposition. You can usually tell by your, as you approach the calcific deposition, whether it's acute or chronic, sometimes these are truly like rocks. Um, if we can get it during the soft stage, it's easier to aspirate. And really then we're just um, uh, injecting some saline and marcaine while we're trying to aspirate the calcium. Once we're done and you can make that calcium collection smaller, if possible, then you go through and fenestrate the margins of this calcific collection through the entire collection. Um, and then we'll also put some steroid again and freezing in the bursa on our way out. If you're successful, and there's various uh, articles that describe this technique, you'll get this layering calcium like I show you in the syringe on the left. As soon as you collapse that collection, the patient's symptoms often go away. This can be painful, the procedure itself, so the freezing and steroid in the bursa is very important. Okay, that's MSK. Now I've got some spine cases. I know we're, I'll let you uh, determine the time if we'll get through as many as we can. The first two I'm gonna talk about uh, are the most important. So back pain, initial conservative management is really how we practice here in Canada. As you know, there are many different causes of pain, but the most important one they present to us is trying to determine whether it's radicular or non-radicular. And the things that we can do are try to control pain and inflammation in these conservative um, measures, restore range of motion, improve muscle strength, retrain coordination and exercise. So most of our patients have already gone through some element of this by the time they present to us. So here, first spine case is a patient with back pain, radiating notably to the left leg for a history of one year, no trauma. So x-ray, uh, is, tends to be not particularly helpful in these cases in terms of planning next steps, but certainly here we can see a little bit of uh, disc space narrowing at L5, S1, but the facet joints look well aligned, no pars defects, SI joints look okay. So for all back pain, conservative management is what we suggest for at least six months. This patient has now had symptoms for a year and we suggest no MRI in Canada. Again, we're trying to utilize appropriately unless there are red flags. Um, and again, there are papers describing these, but here are our list of red flags that we look for. So cauda equina symptoms, unexplained weight loss or fever, patient is immunosuppressed, history of cancer, IV drugs or steroids, uh, progressive neurologic deficit, significant trauma, unremittent pain at night or when lying down, or over 65 with first episode of severe back pain. And we're trying to tease out these patients who probably need MRI sooner to manage. But I would tell you in my experience that patients who have significant pain less than six months who don't qualify for an MRI often will go and pay privately 
and it is a really important test to have for our management. So in this case, the patient had pain for a year and went on to an MRI. Uh, here you can see at L5-S1, there is a disc herniation. And on the axial, it's off to the left side. And this is preferentially compressing that traversing left S1 nerve. This is exactly where the patient's symptoms were. So we found what looks like a solitary cause for symptoms with a single nerve involvement in this patient. Can we help them? Well, yes, we can. Um, we want to confirm, first of all, and we use, I use this Netter diagram often with patients, having them point to me, where is your pain? And it's, it's quite an easy diagram for them to use, and they'll show you exactly where the pain goes. And in this patient, uh, the patient really did track specifically along the left leg in the S1 distribution. So for patients with radicular pain, the literature would suggest that only 3 to 4% have herniated disc or symptomatic stenosis. In my clinical experience, it's much higher for patients who have radicular pain. Um, and uh, certainly if it's an acute uh, radicular pain in a younger patient, it's typically a disc herniation. If like this patient, it's a single nerve distribution, we're gonna suggest an initial transferaminal epidural steroid injection. It's a mouthful, but really this is a selective nerve block and these patients do quite well. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, just pointing out that there's a, in Canada and maybe in India that there's a choose wisely. We're trying to across all of medicine recommendations for appropriate use of both MRI and, and therapies. In this case, uh, the choose wisely suggests we use epidural steroid injections for patients who have low back pain um, and do have radicular symptoms, which again makes sense. We don't wanna be doing this for patients just with low back pain. If they don't have radicular symptoms, we're not suggesting typically a nerve root block. Um, some studies recently, epidural corticosteroid injection for radicular, radiculopathy and spinal stenosis done in 2015, looked at 30 placebo controlled studies, and really they came up to suggest that ESI, or epidural steroid injection, provides immediate decrease in pain and improved function for radiculopathy due to disc herniation. This is a majority of these young patients coming in with acute new back pain with radicular symptoms. It is, tends to be less effective with spinal stenosis. Um, so quickly then this case, and then I'll stop and you can tell me if you want me to go on. Uh, we did a left transferaminal epidural steroid injection. We have the patient position prone. On the left, you see we use our small gauge, 25 gauge spinal needle uh, into the S1 neural foramen. And on the right, we use some contrast to make sure that we're tracking around that nerve in the nerve sheath. Uh, and so our technique, once the needle is positioned in the correct foramen, we, we use a lateral to check our depth and make sure we're at the right level. Um, and we use contrast. Once we've done that and we're confident the needle's in the right position, we do a test injection with 1% lidocaine and we let that soak in for uh, two minutes. The patient obviously it relieves symptoms but it also gives us a chance to, to test um, nerve function. So if after two minutes, the patient still has normal strength and sensation in that leg compared to the contralateral side, then we proceed. Uh, for these transferaminal epidural injections, we use non-particulate steroid. We use 10 milligrams of dexamethasone and we flush that with an additional small volume of 2% lidocaine. Patient stays in our clinic for about 15 minutes. They'll often have leg numbness um, but they shouldn't really have weakness. So really we wanna watch them just to make sure that they're steady before they go home. They're not allowed to drive. They'll often have someone with them and we're recording our pre and post procedure diagnostic pain score. So in this case, the patient's pain score went from nine to zero. This is an effective uh, treatment. Just a note here that disc herniation can also compress exiting nerves depending on where the disc goes, obviously. These uh, really pretty uh, diagrams from um, Jenkins done in 2001 show you if the disc herniates you know, more, more posteriorly or superiorly, it can affect some of the exiting nerves at that level rather than just the traversing nerves. So really it's important to choose your selective nerve block, your transferaminal epidural steroid injection based on your MRI coordinated with the patient's symptoms. So I'm just gonna pause there and make sure we're okay for time. Would you like me to continue?
I think you should continue. It's very, very interesting. I, I will carry on, but uh, please stop me if you want me to stop. We've got a few more cases here. So um, just quickly, can we do this in the spine? Well, uh, cervical spine rather. Yes, we can. So here's a case, for example, a 40 year old patient with left C6 radiculopathy. You can see on the uh, x-ray, there's some disc base narrowing here at five, uh, six with spurring, but otherwise the spine looks not bad. Um, patient went on to MRI and the MRI certainly shows multi-level disc bulging from C4 through C7, but the patient is quite a specific radicular pattern. Now, I preface this by saying in the cervical spine, as you know, with the brachial plexus, there is some overlap. The radicular distribution can be less clear than in the lumbar region, but nonetheless, I think we need to be specific in terms of how we treat and choosing the best level based on the findings. So in this patient, they're off to the side here, parasagittal, there was a more specific C7 uh, disc bulge and herniation here, which uh, was compressing the left C8 nerve. And I try to show you that on the MRI. So this is the exiting C8 nerve at this level. And this was the site uh, designated for the transforaminal epidural injection. So how do we do it in the cervical region? Well, obviously, uh, we need to be very careful. There's tiger country here in terms of where we're putting needles. So when we find a specific nerve root uh, compressed in the cervical region, we approach it doing a transfacet epidural injection. The acronym here, the TFESI, can be very similar. So we try to keep it as transfacet ESI in the cervical region um, rather than transferaminal. So here's a separate patient done a little bit higher up on the right at the C4 level. Um, in this patient, we would, our case patient, we would have uh, put a needle and basically you go right into the adjacent facet joint. So in our case example, it would have been C7T1. In our sample here that I'm showing you, I don't have the follow-up for that other case. This is a C4, C5 facet injection. And basically what we do is like any other facet injection, you're gonna put your needle into the facet joint and confirm with contrast. Then you keep downward pressure on the needle as you distend that facet joint capsule with the goal to rupture it. Um, so we'll often put contrast in and distend it. Once distended with contrast, I switch my needle to a lidocaine, 2%, and you continue downward pressure. These can be difficult physically to do, but eventually the facet joint capsule will rupture and you'll see that contrast distribute along the nerve. And once you've seen that extravasation, we inject 10 milligrams of dexamethasone um, for these transfacet injections. Again, afterwards, we'll monitor the patients for about 15 minutes, and we do keep track of their uh, grip strength in both hands to ensure it's symmetric. And we'll document a pre and post uh, procedure pain score. So are these safe? Uh, certainly, uh, we, we do not do interlaminar epidural injections in the cervical region. There have been some patients who've had strokes but these transfacet selective nerve blocks uh, epidural injections are quite effective. So here's um, a review um, done in 2009, for example, where they did um, a retrospective, they initially looked at a retrospective study with 4,600 patients with only two serious complications and more prospective studies have shown this transfacet epidural is a safe treatment but it is important to use non-particulate steroid just in case you get into um, you know, deeper nerve uh, compartments and or vascular compartments. So we do use dexamethasone. So yes, you can do selective nerve blocks in the cervical region uh, with caution and with comfort. Uh, another case here, 69 year old with bilateral posterior leg pain radiating down to the ankles. The patient describes some weakness and it is worse with activity. So this seems to be a ridiculous pattern, but it involves both legs, which makes our approach slightly different. We're not dealing with a single nerve root here. Uh, here's a spine x-ray for this patient. It's no surprise, sometimes we see awful x-rays and you're not really sure how are you gonna initially manage. So in this patient uh, on the x-ray, there's a scoliosis, we're seeing degenerative disc disease, there's um, retrolisthesis, anterolisthesis, significant facet away, probably some element of spinal stenosis. So how are you gonna manage this very complex patient? Well, 
In this case, MRI is important, very important to really track out what could you offer for the patient. Uh, again, one of the Jenkins um, uh, diagrams on the left showing how both disc disease and facet away can result in foraminal narrowing, but also central canal stenosis. So this is the patient's MRI on the right. You can see multi-level disc bulging, DDD. You've got some degenerate change between the spinous processes, the facet away off to the sides. So we need to come back to the clinical presentation here. The patient has bilateral leg pain that seems ridiculous. So we're going to assume that there's an element of uh, central canal stenosis and nerve compression. And really the way to manage these patients is to get to the safest, most superior level to inject. Uh, so in this case, we're looking here is at L4, L5, uh, an axial um, oblique level through this shows certainly an element of central canal stenosis. There's some facet away, ligament and flavum thickening, lateral recess narrowing more on the right than the left. And at L5, S oh, and I should just go back. Uh, what's important here though, and I, I haven't shown you the T1, there's a little bit of fat, but not a lot of epidural fat. Uh, and that is important when we're planning our approach for this procedure that I'll talk about in a moment. Here at L5, S1, there's also um, central canal stenosis, facet away, there's some antralisthesis, um, and I don't show you the T1 here, but there is a little bit of epidural fat that was accessible here. So what are our treatment options? Well, I think we need to go with non-surgical conservative measures, obviously rest, oral medication, maybe bracing. Um, most patients have already gone through the rest and oral medication by the time they present to us. So what we can offer them um, before surgery, which again, many of these, which I think this is a complicated surgery, and the most uh, spine surgeons would um, prefer every other conservative measure first. So what we do offer them is an interlaminar epidural steroid injection. So in contradistinction to the transferaminal here, we're providing a more central injection of steroids that should bathe multiple nerve roots and provide um, some treatment for both exiting and traversing nerves, so more than one nerve, and can uh, treat both sides. So how do we do this? Here is a diaphragmatic um, representation uh, showing a posterior approach. We usually do parasagittal approach, which I'll show you in a moment, but basically a needle injecting into the epidural space. And that the green is showing you where that um, steroid should be. It'll go around the traversing nerves and it should be extending out on the L5 and the S1 level. And knowing the MRI uh, and the fact that there's a little bit of antralisthesis here of L5 on S1, we chose to go at the L5 S1 level. I will tell you that more commonly for patients with multi-level, we will try at L3, L4 level or higher. But here on the right, we're showing you how we approach. So we're doing a parasagittal approach posteriorly with a needle going in. Sometimes these patients can be hard to see fluoroscopically but the needle point is extending just into the, um, just deep to the uh, posterior uh, facet processes here. So when we get the needle in place, uh, we do do some contrast. There's actually contrast in this image, but it's difficult to see. I'll show you another one in a moment. And you'll see it layering along the posterior epidural space up and down the spine preferentially. The spread of contrast is obviously limited as well by the degree of spinal stenosis. Uh, disc herniation, facet away, et cetera. So again, once we're comfortable with our needle position, like with our transferaminal epidural, we'll perform a test injection. So we use 1% lidocaine, let it soak in for two minutes. Again, this is providing some pain relief, but it's also less letting us test to make sure that this will be a safe injection. If the patient's strength and sensation in both legs is similar to when they came in, no change, then we proceed. In these cases with the interlaminar epidurals, we give 15 milligrams of dexamethasone, slightly higher dose, again with a small flush of 2% lidocaine to help distribute it around that region. Patients stay with us again in the clinic for 15 minutes, make sure that they're steady uh, and able to wait there before they leave. 
again, they're not able to drive and they should be with um, someone. And we do record their pre and post uh, diagnostic pain score. So here's a companion case. Uh, some patients, as you know, can't have an MRI. It's okay to work off a CT, um, but we prefer MRI. It just gives us some better uh, data. So here's another uh, patient, again, with multi-level DDD, facet away, and multi-level um, stenosis. So here at L2, L3, we tend not to go at the L2, L3 level if we can avoid it. Um, we try to go lower. Also, you'll find most patients have L4, L5, more typically L5 and S1 symptom related to low back pain. So we tend to go lower. It tends to be safer territory um, than L2, L3. But I'll show you what the other levels look like. Um, so on the top on the right, that's L3, L4. And, and then lower is L4, L5. And what we're looking for is that small triangle of fat in the epidural space at the back. You can see it on your sagittal sequences. It looks quite accessible at L4, L5 and on your axial series. So here, for example, on this patient, we actually went ahead and did uh, an interlaminar at the L3, L4 level where there's some epidural fat. I should point out that we use a TRUI syringe with a loss of um, pressure. So again, you approach these very gently, parasagittal uh, position, and we tend to get a pillow under the patient's spine, their, um, sorry, on their stomach, having them lie prone. It will help straighten the spine for you and approaching very cautiously with loss of syringe um, as you go. Once you get, once you, uh, we have saline attached to that syringe. So once you feel the loss of uh, resistance and your saline drains, you're going to add a little bit of contrast. Here I'm showing you with the blue arrows how the contrast is layering in the epidural space at the back. If you see your contrast flush dependently towards the back of the vertebral bodies or distribute, you know that you're no longer in the epidural space uh, and more likely in the subdural space, uh, you should stop your procedure. But here we see the contrast layering nicely up and down the spine in that epidural space. Uh, okay, case four here, patient with low back pain, worse with activity. This patient has symptoms radiating just to the gluteal region, not down the legs, chronic, no weakness, but they are occasionally ex uh, explaining some numbness down the left leg along the anterior thigh. Typically the upper part of the clinical presentation with gluteal pain, chronic weak and no weakness is more what you'll get, but we're trying to tease out here if the patient has any numb or any nerve symptoms. Numbness is something you should be aware of. So again, talking to the patient and showing them the graph, they really actually do point to a very particular dermatome in the L4 distribution. So how are we gonna manage this patient? So here's their x-ray, there's a bit of scoliosis, some disc base narrowing, certainly some facet OA um, at L4-5 and L5-S1, but no PARS defect. So the patient goes on to have an MRI. And here, these diagrams, you'll start to see when you have facet OA, the facet joint can get thickened with synovial thickening that can encroach the exiting nerves. You may have some retrolisthesis or anterolisthesis, some disc bulging. And you can see on the MRI, you know, certainly there could be element of central canal stenosis or um, peripheral nerve or lateral recess encroachment. But this patient, we're looking for a specific L4 nerve. What's happening with the L4 nerve? So when we look at this, actually, the patient does have a little lateral disc bulge um, at this level and is compressing the L4 nerve. Now, this is probably exacerbated by that facet away, but because of the specific L4 nerve um, presentation, rather than other procedures, in this case, we went on and did a transforaminal L4 nerve block. How much of the pain and the, the numbness will go away? So again, here I'm showing you uh, in the lumbar spine, we do an oblique approach with a small um, spinal needle uh, at the L4 transforaminal level. I'm showing you the lateral on the right side. went from nine to zero, which would suggest that a lot of this pain is coming from this nerve. Um, I will caution you that if patients present only with numbness, 
often you may not see relief, but it may take a week or two for these uh, injections to help with numbness symptoms. So companion case here, 63 year old, also with back pain and left, notable left leg pain. X-ray shows typical DDD, lots of facet away. But when you've got a patient with a, like unilateral, more ridiculous symptoms, um, you know, you, we need to tease this out. In this case, the patient, given the notable facet away, did go on and have facet joint injections at L4, L5. That did provide some relief of the low back symptoms, but there are persistent left leg symptoms. So the patient went on to have an MRI. And for sure, as we've seen, the patient has facet away, but notably there was also a synovial cyst off that left facet joint, and that was compressing the left L5 nerve. So despite the facet joint injections, often these synovial cysts were, will persist. Um, and because of the patient's radicular symptoms that persisted, we actually, in this case, went on to uh, one of the rare CT uh, guided treatments that we do, and we did a cyst aspiration. When we see synovial cysts related to the facet joints that are extending into the spinal canal, we always start with a facet joint injection. Sometimes it's just synovitis and that will settle down with a steroid facet injection. But if they don't respond, then we go on to cyst aspiration or if that's not possible, a cyst rupture under CT guidance. This patient's left uh, leg symptoms resolved. So a few more cases here briefly, but important now. Uh, patient with low back pain, worse with activity. This is far and away the most common presentation you'll get. Typically patients describe radiation to the gluteal region, chronic, no weakness, similar to the history I provided before. Here's the same x-ray, you know, is it helpful? Uh, what we can see is a little bit of DDD, but there are no ridiculous symptoms and facet away. So we, uh, in this case, the yellow is highlighting the facet joint where the patient, sometimes it's hard to tell which facet joint is inflamed, but certainly the patient has L4, L5 and L5, S1 facet um, OA. And so we'll often offer an injection at each level. And we try to tell the patient to be very careful in trying to keep track of which uh, injection was most effective. So we can limit future injections to just the level where they're most painful. Often, the patient will have multi-level OA, but typically it's just one or two levels that are the cause of pain. So in this case, uh, given the patient's distribution, they can, they can often point to you under fluoroscopy where it hurts if you need some guidance. And this patient had L4, L5 predominant symptoms. So on the right, you can see we've gone on to a 4-5 facet joint injection. And it was done bilaterally. The patient's pain score went from seven to zero which would suggest that the facet away at L5 slash, or S1 rather, is not um, contributing to the patient's current symptoms. So facetogenic pain is a huge burden of disease. Um, facet joints, as you know, um, can be affected by osteoarthritis, but importantly, they can also be affected by instability, whether there's a PARS defect or just OA causing instability or some regional ligamentous um, damage. These patients often present with paravertebral low back pain, uh, worse with extension and rotation. And typically they do describe a little bit of radiation, but you need to tease it out because it won't typically go below the gluteal fold and they won't have any ridiculous symptoms down the leg or neurologic defect. So conservative treatments, heat, exercise, core strength. What can we do for needle options? Here there's a multi-phased approach. We can do an intraarticular facet injection, which I've just shown you. If that's effective, we can go on to provide radiofrequency ablation, but they have to have medial branch blocks um, before we can provide an RFA. If the patient is unstable or there's significant facet away, sometimes they'll go on to have a decompression and stabilization surgery. So imaging facets, just briefly, we like to add the oblique views to get a better view of that Scotty dog and to look for PARS defects. Uh, we do do PARS injections, but of course, these might be more related to stability rather than active inflammation. Um, the flexion extension views are helpful um, to find different levels that might be involved. There was a study recently done which would suggest that um, perhaps doing a supine view, a lateral x-ray, might be more valuable than an extension radiograph. You're using the patient's body weight to look for change in um, in alignment of the spine and so some level of instability. 
Um, here's a CT scan showing facet away significant at L4, L5. This is the same patient from earlier. There's also uh, L5S1 facet away and DDD. So another way to try to find out what is actively remodeling is to do a bone scan. So in this patient, we've done a CT spect, which shows uptake at the L4 or 5 facet joints uh, bilaterally, and also notably at L5S1 um, disc space. We'll talk about the disc space in a bit. There's unfortunately not a lot that we can do um, by needle therapy, but the facet joints we can help. So uh, the study showed that by actually doing a bone scan, it can help predict the outcome of um, joint injection. So in patients with multi-level facet away and DDD, who can't really give us a specific level, we'll often suggest a bone scan with CT SPECT first, which will help localize um, where to start. Sometimes the bone scan is negative, but if it is positive, it will really help limit your injections uh, and your therapy. Um, PARS defects, again, just as I mentioned, important to find. Often these patients will have pain, may respond to injections, but I find they tend to respond more briefly. Often it's more related to instability or secondary degenerative changes. So how do we, what do we do for these? Well, we'll do these uh, facet joint or PARS injections. We do start as always with steroids. And the benefit is to decrease that synovial thickening and swelling and regional synovitis that's often chronic. Um, it also helps, I think, increase the viscosity of the intraarticular synovial fluid. Um, sometimes it makes those facet joints uh, move better and patients have less mechanical symptoms, but certainly it's a variable response. Um, what else could we do? Can we, what about HA? What about PRP? What about saline? Well, Sometimes the joints are quite capacious um, and often you won't know until you get in and do the injection. There was a study put out a few years ago um, suggesting that hyaluronic acid would be is more effective um, compared to corticosteroid for short-term pain relief and long-term functional improvement, but that both have similar short-term functional improvement. Uh, I have done some hyaluronic acid injections into facet joints. Um, you need to be careful. You need to use um, the more, uh, sorry, the less viscous. I tend to use synvisc, small volume, 0.5 cc. Um, and you need to be quite careful. It's hard to ensure you're getting the hyaluronic acid into these tight joints. And patients do do quite well. Um, just briefly then. So if a patient responds to a facet joint injection with steroid, you can go on to RFA. Um, radio frequency duration works quite well for patients. Um, I'm just showing you back here, this is the complex anatomy. The, the red highlight is really showing you what, where we're trying to inject, which is the medial branch of the dorsal uh, spinal mm -hmm. ramen, extending along the posterior facet joint. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so RFA, radio frequency ablation, you're ablating the nerve supply of the facet joint and hoping to relieve the pain. These symptoms can uh, improve for about a year, but it is quite a prolonged process to get to it. Um, your success really depends on your patient selection. So all patients must have a medial branch block before where you do two separate diagnostic blocks at each level. So it's quite labor intensive and can be expensive to find the right patients. We do two separate blocks, MBBs, one with bupivacaine and one with lidocaine. We blind the patient and then we track their pain response over the next eight hours. So these are just anesthetic treatments. If the patient's pain score goes down by more than 50% with both of these diagnostic blocks, then it's a reasonable patient to go on to RFA. So there's lots of literature out there about setting up an RFA program and patient selection. Um, I would say our RFA wait lists are very long and the process to getting there is, uh, as I said, expensive and labor intensive. Here's an MBB uh, for each level that you do, you do two, two, uh, each facet level you'll do, you do two injections. And if there's some adjacent facet levels, you'll, you'll do a three injection as we've done here for L4-5 and L5-S1 facet joints. Patient responds well, so you go on and you can do a radiofrequency ablation. Uh, 
last case here, I believe, 45 year old fit woman with chronic low back pain, uh, worse with activity, worse in the morning, limited response to medication. She did have facet injections uh, at L5 S1 and no response. So this is a 45 year old woman, fairly somewhat crippled by pain. So, and no ridiculous symptoms. These is important to remember what I always describe as the largest facet joint, which is the right, or sorry, the sacroiliac joints immediately below your facet joints. Um, in this case, your pain localized over the posterior pelvis. For those of you who are old enough um, and are familiar with the 80s jeans pockets, which are now coming back, if you ask the patient, if you're gonna put your hands in your 80s jeans, is that where the pain is? And they say, yes, this is likely sacroiliac, it tends to be just below and just lateral to the typical facet distribution. So in this case, this 45 year old woman, we inject the right SI joint and her pain went from five to zero. Uh, one qualification about facet or sacroiliac joints rather, yes, there can be synovitis in a way, but often in younger patients, it can be related to instability. So although our injection will help, uh, if a patient returns to activity, sometimes they come back and the patient's symptoms recur. Uh, so this can be a hard problem to solve. But it's important to remember the SI joint when you're talking about back pain. It is a great mimicker. It can be buttock pain. It can be lower lumbar spine pain. It can also radiate to the groin. Sometimes you can get pain that radiates below the gluteal region into the leg and sometimes below the knee, according to some of the physiatry literature. I would say predominantly to at least the gluteal region and possibly the upper hamstring. So just to be aware, it's also a very difficult clinical exam. So ultimately, Diagnosis is often based on injection. Uh, osteoarthritis, instability, and sacroiliitis, common causes of uh, pain at this joint. Just briefly now, DDD, this is our same patient from earlier. We've got uh, disc disease at L5, S1, and we know it was active on bone scan. Unfortunately, <laughs> despite uh, the uptake and the remodeling here, there's not a lot that we can do. Sometimes before surgery, a surgeon may request a discogram. And in this case, we'll um, do a paraspinal approach under CT guidance um, into the disc and doing an anesthetic injection. If the patient's symptoms resolve from that, the patient, um, the surgeons often consider that a reasonable patient to go on for, um, for surgery. But really other... oblique, try a facet joint injection. If you can determine the level, go to that level first. If there's multi-level disease or it's uncertain clinically, you could provide a bone scan knowing that uh, there is radiation associated with that. So we tend to avoid it in our younger patients. If the patient doesn't respond to your facet and joint injections, but has lower pain, remember that SI joint, uh, you may want to try an injection there. If the patient is, um, has ongoing symptoms, other things you consider, um, pseudoankylosis of transverse process, Berlottis, which is um, inflammation and synovitis between the posterior spinous processes. So kind of a stepwise approach far and away, facet joints are the most common cause here. For patients with radicular symptoms, um, radiating below the gluteal fold, again, we start with x-ray and obliques, although it provides limited response. Um, you may try a facet joint injection. And the reason I mention this is the facet joints, as I've shown, are right next to some of those nerves. And sometimes a facet joint injection will provide some uh, mild uh, radicular uh, pain relief um, just by virtue of being right adjacent to the nerve and possibly compressing it. But typically, if the patient has radicular symptoms, um, we try to get them an MRI as soon as possible. Um, and that really helps us plan out our next step. As I've shown you, if it's a specific nerve in a specific distribution, you'll do the safer transferaminal epidural injection or in the cervical region, you can do a transfacet epidural injection to relieve the pressure off that one nerve. If there is multi-level, um, multi-nerve involvement or bilateral involvement, it makes sense in the lumbar region to go interlaminar, more central, where you can approach uh, multiple nerves and provide hopefully the patient with less diagnostic, but um, more broad pain and, and symptom relief. 
So stepwise management, facetogenic versus radicular, you need to have some kind of an intake form questions for patients to help clarify. Uh, but the injections certainly in our community provide significant diagnostic value. Even if the steroid response is limited, it will help direct other conservative or possible surgical therapy. So a little long, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Sir, it was a great session and actually I learned a lot. So before anyone start, I have lots of questions. Okay. I'll start with, uh, first with the, how we differentiate clinically between uh, facetogenic pain and the radicular pain. I, I know it is a very basic question, but uh, no, it's it's important to uh, it's important to uh, to review. So really, the facetogenic pain you're going to talk about low back pain, but it should stop at the gluteal fold. It tends not to go below the gluteal fold. So, whereas radicular pain is is different. It is going below the gluteal fold, down the leg, typically at least to the knee, and often below the knee, sometimes to the ankle. So if you have a patient who has just leg symptoms and radiating below the gluteal fold, it's radicular until proven otherwise. If you have a patient with low back pain and it extends just to the buttock, just to the gluteal region, you're going to assume it's facetogenic, maybe, maybe sacralia. Um, and that's how you really differentiate. How far does it, if it goes below the gluteal fold, consider it radicular. So it means I could say that if the patient is having just the back pain, as you have suggested, at least for any injection, we have to wait for about a year uh, before going for any injection. That, well, I would proceed if they have just back pain, go straight to facet injections. I think that's really valuable and it, it does provide some diagnostic value. The waiting a year is more about the MRI and that's in our environment here in Canada. Um, they want to wait a year um, at least six months um, before you have an MRI. They're trying to limit the use of MRI, um, but often patients who present with either red flags or sooner um, will have an MRI sooner. Nonetheless, by the time patients present to us, many have already had months of conservative care and not responded. Uh, uh, if we are... can, I, can I finish my question, Sue? Yes, sorry, yeah. sorry. So, so, so if we are, if we are, uh, we were discussing about the trans, uh, trans facet injections. So when we are injecting into the facet, how do you sure that you, uh, when you are sure that we have ruptured the capsule and it is now going into the epidural space? Yes. And so typically what happens is you'll, uh, you'll see the, um, in the cervical region, we're talking about the trans facet, you'll see the facet joint distend and expand, but it really just sticks around the facet joint. It has a linear morphology right around the facet joint. You'll feel and see when it ruptures, the pressure eases off on your syringe and you'll see the contrast tracking along the epidural space, along the exiting nerve. So it may track more central, but typically it tends to go more peripheral where there's less pressure. So you'll both feel and see that extravasation. So it means when we have confirmed that we are in the proper place, we of course we have injected some injection and then if we inject bupivacaine, it will further rupture and it, we see the contrast as ex, uh, and uh, you put the, uh, the uh, so you have uh, to told us about the medial epicondylitis Mm -hmm. And besides that, what are the other muscular pathologies where these needling helps? Yeah, and I, uh, it's hard to do in, in one short session this morning, but we inject um, in and around, as you mentioned, we do the lateral epicondyle, the medial epicondyle at the elbow. Um, we can do the long head of biceps tendon at the proximal shoulder, um, sometimes around the wrist if you have tendons that are inflamed. Um, more tenosynovitis to queer veins we inject. Um, Achilles tendon, patellar tendon, um, gluteal tendons. We do a lot of greater trochanteric bursal injections right next to the gluteal tendons, uh, hamstring. So pretty much any tendon, if we can, we'll always do an ultrasound first for tendons to show that it's intact and make sure there's no tear. But if that's also the nice benefit of ultrasound is often you can really document where the exact pain is. 
Um, so once we've confirmed that, then we will inject around pretty much any tendon. About the uh, trigger point. So it is uh, identifying the trigger point. It is the patient is telling that this is the point of injection and you're at the same point, you are putting the needle and uh, uh, rupturing it or uh, pinning it. Yes, Tr trigger points are hard. Um, they're hard because uh, I don't, besides a little bit of diagnostic value, we're not providing a treatment or a cure for this patient. But often we find with trigger points, patients have had series of therapy, whether chiropractic, physiotherapy, um, massage, and there's a persistent local area of pain that they can't figure out. And so exactly as you mentioned, we put a needle in, a lot of people are doing trigger point injections in their offices. In our practice, we do it under ultrasound just to show that we're getting into the muscle levels, you know, in typically it's in the upper back. So we want to make sure we're not going beneath the pleura. Um, so, and typically we're just injecting in the muscle. And I found that somewhat helpful. A lot of these um, upper back and trapezius kind of chronic muscle uh, injuries, strains, pain, by doing a trigger point injection, it gives us the confidence if the patient's pain goes away with some anesthetic at that level to say, look, this is a muscle-based problem, you know, massage, acupuncture should be treatable. Occasionally for these patients, if it really is muscle-based, we'll, we'll trial Botox, which I haven't talked about today, but sometimes we do intramuscular Botox um, just to help relieve some of that tension and, um, and tightness in a muscle. Regarding this barbotage treatment, uh, you basically inject the needle, break the calcium, inject them some saline, and then as repeated aspiration. So in one go, how much you inject? Means one ml you inject it, aspirate it, or how do you do? Can you explain it uh, again? Sure, yeah. And there's a few, again, um, some of the literature will show you different techniques. As I said, we use the single, um, single needle technique, uh, which is within one deposition, we're gonna put the needle in once. Others will do two needles in, so you're aspirating or you're injecting saline and aspirating on the other side. I think one uh, needle poke is really valuable. It will help, uh, you know, you're just blotting with a syringe with saline and a little bit of freezing. And often that's enough to get some of the calcium out. Moving the needle around within the calcium um, collection and you might find, um, hopefully you can get enough calcium out. Uh, depends, sometimes you can inject in. If it's a rock, you can't inject at all. Um, typically though, you can sometimes get up to five cc into a calcium collection. If you're, and you'll see it expand and then collapse as you're aspirating it out. Um, and then really beyond that, we're just injecting into the bursa, which is the steroid in the freezing. Uh, you mean that uh, the steroids are given adjacent to the, adjacent to the, adjacent to the calcific point in the bursa? Yeah, so the bursa lies just above. The calcium is typically in the tendon. And so we are just putting the steroid just into the bursa, just above the tendon. As you're withdrawing your needle, you put a, you'll inject a saline or freezing and you'll see it distend the bursa and that's where you place your, your steroid in freezing. Thank you, Zora. Now others can ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> just one quick question. I saw in your, uh, in your foraminal injections for the radicular pain, that some of the injections you were doing in what we would pro probably call extrusions. So protrusions, extrusions, sequestrations. So yes. we were taught that, uh -huh. that sequestrations are surgical, mm -hmm. extrusions are mostly surgical, can be radiological, protrusions radiological. So how far do you stretch your injection uh, thing when you're, you know, for radicular pain? Well, and I, I think a lot of it comes back to, uh, in these cases, how the patient's doing. A lot of the surgeons actually like having these injections because regardless of what the disc looks like, uh, whether it's protrusion, extrusion, um, if the nerve is compressed and we can do this injection and the patient's entire symptoms go away, then the surgeon has the confidence to say, okay. It's a diagnostic it, as well. It, exactly. So maybe I can wait. Maybe this will dry up or, you know, yeah. retract with time. Let's wait on surgery versus if it's a really big disc herniation, one nerve, 
often we're doing it more for symptom relief before the patient can get to surgery. Does oh, that help? Okay. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. No, no, that's, that's logical. Okay, thank you, thank you. Pleasure. Any students have asked questions? Yes, yes. Uh, so, Dr. Trutti has asked, how do we manage pseudo-sepsis following HA injection? So, um, we've been trying to develop our own algorithm and share it with the emergency doctors. So, um, basically, if the patient is supportive measures, if they have these pseudo-septic reactions, we want to mostly reassure the patient. They want to have pain medication fairly regularly, anti-inflammatories, and use cold or heat, depending on um, what feels better. And then we have them call us back. Typically, as I say, the patient's symptoms go away within 24 to 72 hours. If the patient's symptoms have not gone away, we have them come back to the clinic um, or to call us. And then they'll come back in and we'll do an ultrasound. Is there an effusion? Is there synovitis? Um, if there's a big effusion at that stage, then we'll aspirate it and send it for cytology and culture. Um, and we may, we usually wait on the culture, we'll aspirate you know, only if there's an effusion and only if the symptoms have really not resolved after at least 72 hours, typically we'll wait till a week out. Um, but we'll often do a culture. We know the patient's afebrile, uh, wait for the culture results, and then we'll inject steroids in those few patients who just do not settle down otherwise. Okay. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, for the larger joints, if the joints are having effusions, Mm -hmm. uh, so do you aspirate the uh, fluid before injecting it uh, to increase the concentration of the drug or you just inject it and leave the... No, that's a good question. Um, I, I would typically aspirate if I can find an effusion when I inject. I would say when you get into a hip joint, rarely is there an effusion. Glenohumeral joint, yes. Maybe some of the upper extremity uh, and knee joint, yes. Um, but some joints you'll almost never get fluid out. So um, yes, if you can aspirate it out, um, I think it'll make the patient more comfortable for one. And certainly, as you say, increase the concentration of your HA. Dr. Dr. Irana has asked, uh, he has asked about the PRP related skin complications. How do we manage? And he has seen a patient with history of PRP injection into ankle joint, and there was mild hyperpigmentation at the injection site. Um, I've not seen this in my experience, um, so I'm not sure how the procedure was done. Uh, you know, in our experience, we're doing the smallest needle joint possible or a needle into the joint possible. So if it's an ankle joint, it's typically our freezing needle, which is 22 gauge, which we freeze on Q, inject into the joint. Uh, and then we, um, once we have contrast, we put the PRP right in. So I've not seen skin changes related to PRP, so I'm not sure if that's a needling approach. Uh, typically, we do one needle uh, injection straight into the joint. So uh, I can't comment on that, actually. Arun, can I ask a question, Arun? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay, uh, Sana, I had a patient uh, who had a uh, known case of neurofibromatosis. And uh, he had mm -hmm. uh, radicular pain along the left uh, sciatic nerve and uh, some amount of tingling also along the nerve in the foot region. And when I saw his MRI, there was an eccentrically placed nerve sheet tumor involving the sciatic nerve as it came out of the sciatic foramina. Okay. So uh, I was talking to all my colleagues how to handle this. Though my plan was if I could, uh, you know, probably do an RFA, we don't have a cryo in India. But then I, I took a chance and I said, let me just separate the tumor from the nerve mm -hmm. and did an uh, injection there with uh, lignocaine and uh, no, lignobuvacaine and I injected uh, steroid also with some yeah. saline. So I separated the, 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 the tumor away from the nerve and now I'm planning that since it has helped the patient, RFA should be a good choice. Yeah. I think that's great. That's um, we didn't get into the peripheral nerves here today. Just too much, um, too many, too much data. Yes, but for, for sure. We uh, more and more, we're quite um, peripheral nerve injections are really valuable. Again, helping you like what next? You know, do the symptoms go away? Are the symptoms attributable at this level? Is it higher? You know, even in the spine, there's discussion about pre or post ganglionic injections. 
uh, which I haven't mm -hmm. discussed in detail, but I think but that's great. RFA will work, do you think? RFA will be good for, it's a, a, a nice size tumor, about 1.7 centimeter. Yeah, listen, I think if you can separate it away from the sciatic nerve and get it out of the range, that's going to be your biggest um, concern. Um, yes. So, you know, without seeing it and knowing how close it is. Um, right. It's, it's the, it's I, can, the burn, I can send uh, you the images. Here. I can send yeah. you the images. Yeah. Yeah, send me and I'll, um, I'll share it with my spine colleagues and it's nice to, to see what people are doing. Yep, sure. Dr. Pushan has asked regarding the case with the scoliosis with the disease as multiple lumbar levels, mm -hmm. the patient has complaint of weakness. Isn't it the case for surgery because motor weakness can often progress to foot drop? Uh, that's a really valid point. Absolutely. And a lot of our um, injections we provide in a clinic with spine surgeons. So we sort of have a multidisciplinary practice here. Um, so this patients are often assessed by spine surgeons. Um, certainly that's a complex back and that patient should probably go to have decompression and fusion. The patient, the surgeons often like us to do an injection, sometimes just for symptom relief because the wait lists are often many years out, but often there are some other patients who have contraindications to surgery and is there a way we can manage their pain otherwise? So, um, we try to be appropriate in terms of our injection, make sure we're getting it in a right and safe place that will cover their symptoms to provide some diagnostic benefit for our spine surgeons. Um, so yes, um, no doubt, this is not replacing surgery. This is a corollary and perhaps um, providing some diagnostic benefit. Dr. Sashid. Uh, sorry, sorry yeah, Ajay, Dr. Uh, Arun. Yeah, in Go these ahead. patients who have been operated before uh, with a whole lot of uh, devices and processes put in, uh, does it become more difficult to negotiate the needle? Uh, in the spine or the joints or all of it? Yeah, in the spine, in the spine. Yeah, uh, it can be. Um, you know, we're, we're often careful and, and even as you know, imaging postoperatively is rife with uh, problems trying to see, you know, is there fibrosis? Is there, so we're trying to improve our imaging postoperatively to find out, you know, patients often have recurrent symptoms. Um, but even so, we managed to get around lots of, you know, spinal screws and so forth to get into, you know, subjacent facet joints um, and so forth. So it's manageable. I think having a good C arm is really helpful. Um, okay. In these patients, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shashidhar has asked, how long usually patient will be in pain-free interval for a nerve block done due to disc bulge? That's a great question. Um, typically... Depends if it's acute enough and significant enough. Um, sometimes patients will cannot last the three months, and often at eight weeks they're calling saying, "My pain is back and it's terrible." So, although we say maximum four steroid injections a year and no more than every three months, sometimes in these acute and large disc herniations, we'll do them sooner than three months just to kind of get them through that really acute phase. But often after that, we find that the symptoms begin to settle down, whether that's the you know, nursey synovium that's settling, uh, maybe the disc is beginning to dry up, um, you know, as it phases more into a subacute to chronic. So uh, it really depends, I think, on the patient's acuity and presentation. Um, but uh, in these unusual cases, sometimes you may need to do an injection in advance of three months. Dr. Jeet, is there any question from YouTube? No. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. It was a wonderful session. A lot, and, of, a uh, lot of information, but uh, hopefully somewhat interesting. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, uh, I'm thinking of uh, coming to you to your institute for an observership when the Corona crisis is over. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> when the planes fly again, I'll see you all in Canada. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Possibly yes. when next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the best to you. Take okay. care. Thank you for your time. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you very and much. Dr. Sarah, one, one more request for your for your first webinar. If you can mm -hmm. write, uh, uh, write, you can write and summarize these things. Possibly something like a review of literature. We would like to publish it in our journal. We have a, our uh, Indian journal, Indian Journal okay. of Vascular Intervention Radiology. Okay. JCI. And it is indexed. It is indexed okay, journal.
Yeah, and if you so, so just send me a um, uh, just send me an email with uh, specific what you like, and yeah, right. and I'll, then I can I'll follow up. Thank you, okay. Sarah. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Arun. Hi, sir. Hi. Arun, on first, uh, there is a company which is doing this um, um, lithotripsy for vascular lesions, you know, heart calcified lesions. So mm -hmm. they are conducting a webinar on first, I think, four to five or something. Mm -hmm. I'm on the panel of that. So mm -hmm. what I'll do, I'll forward that in our uh, this thing um, group. So whosoever mm -hmm. wants to attend, we can attend the session then. So this right. is some speaker from Germany. Okay. And uh, also send me, because there are only limited number of uh, members in, the, in that group. So I will circulate through the mail to all the members. Perfect. I'll do that. Okay. Next, who's got it? Sir, uh, I'll call you after this meeting. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Sure. Okay. Sure. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. It worked out very well. Great. Yeah. Bye.